America is an amazing country filled with wonderful people who do incredible things. But too often, the media and liberal politicians ignore big parts of our nation and the people who make it work. So I'm speaking with leaders and policymakers who deal with real problems every day. I'm Ronna McDaniel, and this is Real America. Today, I'm going to be speaking with Marjorie Dannenfelser, the president of Susan B. Anthony List, a nonprofit that advocates for pro-life leadership. We're gonna take a deep dive into the Supreme Court decision on Dobbs, the legal framework for overturning Roe v. Wade, states' rights, and Democrats' extreme position on the issue. I'm so excited to have a very dear friend of mine, somebody I've come to know in my time as chair, Marjorie Dannenfelser, uh, the head of the Susan B. Anthony list, and just welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I've really been looking forward to it. I get to talk to you all the time, but now we could share it with everybody else. I know. It's so fun. This mm -hmm. is a new studio we just put together. It's amazing. Um, but I know we've been wanting to have you on, and we've talked about this. It's it's pretty timely. Yeah. Um, before we talk about the Dobbs decision and other things, I want to get to know you a little bit more mm -hmm. first. So you grew up in North Carolina. That's right. Tell me a little bit about you and your mm -hmm. history. Well, gosh. So, yeah, I grew up in North Carolina. My mom's family is really from there. So I've, that really is kind of— I hear a little southern in there. Like yeah. I think it's probably because you asked. and It, kinda, <laughs> it came right know, out. Exactly. Um, a glass of wine, it would be even more. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I grew up there, and I um, grew up really pro-choice, even though it's really the Bible Belt. Really? Um, though the discussion wasn't had often. It was kind of the A word. Nobody really talked about it. But when it did— um, I was pretty clear on um, what I thought. And so, but I, I grew up with such great parents and extended family and all that. It was kind of a non-issue. When I went to college, I went to Duke, and I was very adamant that this was not an issue for debate, that it was up to women. I was also kind of a libertarian. Okay. Um, though many libertarians also understand the morality of life, but I certainly did not. I understood me and my voice and uh, my decision. Wow. And I just totally set myself up for the fall because I really didn't have a great argument. I was pre-med, went through, ended up in philosophy. <laughs> okay. And in the end, I really honestly could not answer the question with any degree of intellectual uh, uh, authenticity. What is going on in abortion? Like, what is that act? Huh. Um, and really, when I when it got down to it, I just thought, okay, well, maybe I'm wrong. And if maybe I'm wrong, that is a huge wrong. That's a huge change. It was. And it was. What, what age were you when that happened? You were, I was probably 19, really? something like that. Yeah. And um, and right in the middle of Duke, which definitely was not somebody a, a, a school pushing me in the pro life. No. Way, but definitely wonderful people that surround me. And then I worked at the Heritage Foundation. Okay. Which at that time they were kind of they didn't really want to talk about that issue either. But there were a lot of wonderful people there that I met who would not let me out of that intellectual box that I put myself in. They were like, okay, set yourself free. Just go ahead and give us your best. And I, I lost the argument. And then when I lost that argument, I really fell big time. And uh, obviously, became a real advocate for life instead. And um, and your mother mm -hmm. of five. That's right. Mm -hmm. Five. I, that which is like mind blowing to me because I'm a mother <laughs> of two. We were saying earlier. Yeah. I, um, I'm one of seven, so I kind mm -hmm. of get that. Yeah, we're really close. Where are you? Right, where are you in the? Line I'm middle. You're I'm middle. middle oh, that's perfect. Oldest daughter. We call my middle the t the top of the mountain. <laughs> like, well, know. let me put it this way: my mm -hmm. parents left town. Mm -hmm. I had a brother nine years older than me, and a brother. Uh, four years older than me, and I still got the money. <laughs> they were like, Rana, here's the pizza money. So I understand. I was the, that kid. I can see this. And I think everybody watching can also see this. I was yeah. that kid. So mother yeah. of five. Yeah. Um, tell me how Susan B. Anthony List started, because it started in your living room? Yep, in my living room with lots of kids running around. Um, I had uh, helped start the pro-life caucus in the House okay. with a Democrat and a pro-life, and a Democrat and a Republican pro-life member. That was back when there were some pro-life Democrats. And it was my job to help corral the votes on both sides in any vote that we had. We had to have, uh, we had to get from both sides. So it was it became very, very clear to me, especially because there were so many pro-choice women on the floor back then, uh, that we were really in trouble in the pro-life movement on two fronts. One, that not enough women were speaking up to speak for women and children, and that also there was really not a strong political strategy at the center of the movement. Like 
like every other successful movement had, we were lacking it. I mean, okay. even the tobacco industry had a had a really strong muscle. You know, drugs, everything had a. But everybody not does life. pharma, everybody. tobacco, exactly. Big tech. Everybody has babies? a movement. If you're in DC, mm-hmm. that everybody has a movement. Yeah. So why not unborn babies? And so uh, even though I had that great idea, I had very little um, in terms of resources or help. But it just, it really is just a testimony to, I think, good people at the time that stepped in and kind of saw the same thing and really helped. One of those people was Jane Abraham. I know so Jane. Spence Abraham's, yeah. uh, uh, Senator Spence Abraham's um, wife, and he did many other things, Secretary of Energy. Yeah. She really just kind of brought in all her contacts. It started also, I think is really uh, important to note that it started with um, the help of a diverse group of women. A uh, couple of Democrats, a Quaker, Catholic, you know, kind of like the whole spectrum, really, um, but all united around one cause, that the rights of women were very connected and inextricable from the rights of the unborn child. And it really was cast in the mold of the early suffragists and the early feminists who believed that this cause was a pro-woman's cause. Yeah. And so that really fueled it. We grew, long story short, we grew to the point where we could do statewide uh, battleground, uh, battleground uh, wins, bringing pro life turnout, helping. turnout, all of that, and um, and then we get to a few years ago where we're thinking, okay, now all we need to do, I mean, we didn't know each other well, then. yeah, yeah. Now all we need to do is make sure we have a really strong pro life Senate, <laughs> yeah, really stronger than the yeah. House, even that's 2014, and then we got to get the strongest pro life president that we've ever had. Turns out to be a you know. The uh, fantastic uh, playboy billionaire from Manhattan we never expected <laughs> would be Donald this guy. Trump. His yeah. name is Donald Trump. Uh, and then all we need is a, a three justices. And then we also have to get those people confirmed in the right timing. Uh, and then we just need the perfect case. So uh, truly an impossible task in a short period of time that no one person or any or it, really anyone could do on their own, but an incredible But you've been so strong on that. And and let me brag on you. You started in 1992, but in 2020, you raised $61 million. I think you contacted close to 8 million voters to turn out. I mean, it really mm-hmm. is a huge organization that's helping to turn out pro-life mm-hmm. voters that care about this issue. That we had a theory that the organic power of the pro-life movement that we were aware of could be leveraged in a political way to win to be the winning majority majority in elections that 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 piece that could be the winning majority and it hadn't been tried and you know the the movement that is so powerful it grows every time it fails yeah like what does that mean for, for the power and longevity of the pro life movement really did grow and it really did we really, we did in the pro life movement show what we were made of and we have been able to do that with God's grace every single time since that election well I'll say this, um, I have a very pro-life daughter who's a teenager. And one of the things that really struck me when I first came to D.C. and was at that first March for Life Mm -hmm. was how many young, young, young men and women were there, students, teenagers. Mm -hmm. It was a huge eye-opening moment for me to see these kids, and I'm going to call them kids. I'm not trying to be disparaging. That's how I view them. They were, yeah. Um, Kids out there marching. And I think this movement is bigger than than people know. So let's talk about what's in the news. It's in the news right now. Mm-hmm. And the media is very much um, is twisting things and uh, not being honest. Shocker. Mm-hmm. Uh, but let's talk first about what is Roe v. Wade. Can you explain mm-hmm. that ruling and what was so flawed about it mm-hmm. to begin with? It's it's pretty simple in, in its effect. Um, Roe v. Wade struck down every pro-life protection in the country on one day. Uh, um, it said that you can't legislate in this area. It had a companion decision, which almost no one knows of. It's called the Doe versus Bolden. Came down the same day. Okay. And it defined what the expect exceptions in the third trimester meant when Roe said you can only only legislate here except for the health of the mom. Doe said the health of the mom includes all factors related to her health, including mental health regarding like size of her family. Um, mental readiness for the moment, which by definition is the biggest loophole that uh, that ever was. And so that meant after Roe versus Wade came down, struck all those laws all over the country down in every single state, said state legislators, people of your state, you have no voice about the law in your state and you can't even legislate up until birth. 
up until the birth of your child, there is no loophole. So after decades of attempting to pass laws, even despite that, we every you know in in a in a handful of states got twenty four week limits, um, but basically almost nothing. Really, um, and so. Uh, so the lifting of Roe versus Wade is just the opposite. So we don't know what's going to happen, right. but we've seen this leaked draft. It's making news on the Dobbs case in Mississippi. Uh, I think it's really critical to understand what this means. Mm -hmm. If Roe v. Wade gets struck down by the Supreme Court, which I think most people understand, the courts don't legislate. They don't set the law. It's up to the legislatures. So what does it mean for states' rights and what happens yeah. next if this if this goes through it's just a restoration of states rights to legislate in this matter to let the will of the people speak through their representatives and have the law reflect that will um, and it'll take a while and it'll be messy but it is uh, this this incivility this difficulty the marching the argument the difficulty of this abortion issue has been heightened by the fact that that voice could not be heard mm -hmm. it, that every single state where there was a desire to do anything about it the court says no. They enjoin all of the laws. I really believe that a restoration of civility will occur because consensus will be allowed to make its way into the law. And I'm not saying that we won't continue to disagree. We will. But at least we have an outlet for our opinion. And that is exactly how democracy deals with And the with voters will have decisions. a voice because That's right. guess what? Newsflash. In California, it's going to stay the same. That's right. In New York, it's going to stay the same. Um, Nevada, it's codified into their law. Abortion mm -hmm. will stay the same. So it will just return it back to the legislatures. That's right. And to the states and yeah. the voters mm -hmm. who elect those legislat legislators. And if they don't like what they've done, then the, you, you, then you have like another you election. Like you do on every other issue, you yeah. have another election. That's what what you do here is so vital, you know. Um and I, I think it's important, too, So there, to, to understand the scale of this. There are about 22 states that could move right away, mm -hmm. They meaning they have a law already on the books, say a 15-week limit, a 20-week limit, a heartbeat bill. Uh, it, it, even Alabama has one from conception. So 22 states where they can pretty immediately act. Now, even then, there are snafus and little things that could happen in each state that have to be worked out. The, the, uh, that has to, whatever the law change has to be confirmed by either the AG, Secretary of State, all sorts of complicated things. But basically, 22 states can act. Eight states will be battlegrounds, meaning there's a there's a reason there's like a, a Democratic governor, but a but a Michigan's pro life legislature. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And then there are of course states like in Michigan where they're trying to put the uh, make a constitutional uh, uh, find a, find a right a right to a, a unlimited right to abortion in the Constitution and not allow anybody to have anything to say. So let's talk about where the Democrats are on this issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they've put out their language guidelines. They used to say safe rare, um, the exception, legal, yeah. and legal. Safe, rare, and legal. Mm -hmm. They've changed that. They don't want the rare. It's, it's, it's astounding to me how many states have abortion available on the due date That's right. of a mother. Um, we did a poll. 85% of Americans do not agree with that. They do believe in some restriction. Mm -hmm. And to think about uh, being about to give birth yeah. and knowing that that baby can live outside of your body, mm -hmm. how is that okay? How is that humane? Yeah. How is that what our country stands for? Especially with, and I think you've talked about this a lot, the science has significantly changed mm -hmm. since Roe v. Wade. Oh, yeah. We know a lot more about what the baby is feeling and the pain and, and the development mm -hmm. process. How are you seeing, uh, as you talk to voters, uh, how do they respond to those scientific changes since it Roe is, v. Wade? It's breathtaking, really. Yeah. A friend of mine just said to me recently, you know, that's a birthday abortion. What a way to oh, celebrate anti-celebration. Oh. Anti um, but yes, the the conversations we're having with voters in, in nine battleground states, the ones I know you're focused on all the time, um, are, are really in what I think of the wide middle. We're talking to them about what might be possible. If um, if they vote for the right person in their in their battleground Senate election or their battleground House, like what could possibly be done? Fifteen weeks is such a middle position. Twenty weeks is about the same. And honestly, it doesn't pull that differently when you bring it back to twelve weeks. It's all basically the same, and and it is a consensus. So when we talk to voters, we're talking to people who normally aren't voting in midterms 
uh, independents, Democrats, Republicans who are also able to be persuaded. They think they know what uh, what their candidate's position is or their incumbent's position is. They learn that that candidate's position or that incumbent's position is abortion up until the end and that you have to pay for it versus this candidate's position, who we'd like to get elected, who is for a 15-week limit or at least just consensus yeah. uh, and, and is for building consensus. That dichotomy, this extreme over here uh, for, on, our, on the side of our opponents, and then the reasonable position of our own candidates is the information that they need to make the right decision. And we find at these doors the most amazing stories. They have no idea that that's the position of the incumbent. They actually believe it now. We've found in the past they kind of didn't. And then another thing that happens is, as you might expect, we come across many people who have experienced the horror of, of abortion, who have been carrying this around, haven't talked to anybody about it. And many of them, or uh, there's several examples, but men, many just like this, that a woman will step outside the door, close the door behind her, and this canvasser, this person walking in the neighborhood is the first person they've ever talked to about this wow. pivotal moment in their life and tears. And so we're we're forgetting the vote, yes. But then also um, there's a lot of healing that's going on by just having the conversation. And you and I have talked about this a lot. It really is about the mother and, and the unborn, the baby. And we don't want to demonize mothers. We don't want to demonize women in difficult situations. We want to find a way to support them mm -hmm. and find other options uh, and, and, and know that um, we care for them. That's why there's pre pregnancy crisis centers across mm -hmm. the country that reach out to women in the situation. We know that adoption is, is an option. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that having that conversation and making sure, you know, right now I feel like the media is demonizing pro-life women. Oh, yeah. How can you demonize somebody who values life? I don't understand that. Mm -hmm. we, we may have a difference of opinion. I respect that you mm -hmm. don't agree with me. But, you know, my daughter almost died in birth. Mm -hmm. uh, I took me a long time to get pregnant when I, that was a miracle that first moment. And it was a baby mm -hmm. the second I knew that I was pregnant. Um, that's my belief. It's personal. It's personal for a lot of people. So mm -hmm. being able to have a conversation and, like you say, find consensus yeah. is key but the American people are not for no. nine-month no, birth birthday abortions. And Joe Biden is. Mm. Hillary Clinton yeah. was. Oh, yeah. And I think having been pro-choice, the, the, I think I began to move when I began to see the sonogram. Wow, that kind of looks like a baby. Is it a baby? And then um, the science now about feeling pain. And there's a question in your mind. It is very personal, but, um, but it is also— an, an important series of, of questions and stipulations that have to be, uh, and assumptions that have to be discussed. I also think what you said is really is really true that that we yes we want to serve the baby by helping them um, come into the world. We also are at the service of the mom. Yeah, and she is a mom from that first minute, and it may be one of the most difficult points in her whole life. I had a moment like that, and and there is no desire to talk to anybody. There is no thought that uh, often that I might get over it, but they hear from us, oh yeah, we're going to be, we're going to walk with you. You can handle this. Don't let anybody tell you that you're not strong enough, that you're not, uh, that you don't have agency, that somehow it's all inevitable, that you'll be a failure if you take away the life, the life of this child. And so it is the ultimate act of love to lay down your life for that woman yeah. and then that baby. And it's a beautiful, life-changing thing that can happen even in the middle of darkness. It's amazing what happens over and over. And that is really what the pro-life movement and, and we and my organization have devoted ourselves to is making sure that in each state that's going to be the most ambitious in limiting the law, that it's very clear where all of those resources, not just day of when they find out, but for the first two years of that baby's life, um, what uh, what can there was a variety of needs. Let's make sure that they know where they are. I I, I think that's such an important point to emphasize mm -hmm. that it's about the mother and and the baby, yeah. and we don't want to to attack the mother. Mm -hmm. We want to under we want to have a conversation, and and I'm watching what the Democrats have done, and watching what's happening outside the, the homes of Supreme Court justices. I mean, what do you think about that? 
Mm -hmm. I mean, would you ever do that? Would you ever no. organize? I mean, we Her feel— life implies a few things. Yeah. It's, a, it's an affirmation of the dignity of the other. And uh, that it, there's no—no, no, of course I wouldn't. And, of course, they, they don't. I think that what happened was, you know, they they really decided that uh, in, in 1973 that they— going to take away the right of people to actually v to pass laws that have expressed their opinion on this. They couldn't trust the institutions or people to actually speak. So they took it to the courts to say, don't, you know, um, don't allow people to actually get involved in the institutions that, that were democracy gave to, to resolve this issue. And then now that that's not working out for them, now that the right has been restored to the states, they're going to attack the institution that they've been relying on for 50 years to keep this abortion horror going. So, you know, they, they don't talk about undermining democracy. Talk about uh, eroding the institutions that are supposed to make, uh, that are supposed to sustain all of us. Um, that is exactly what they're doing. And if they, they cannot, I don't believe they'll get away with it, but they can't get away with it because intimidating a Supreme Court judge certainly is illegal despite what the White House is saying. Despite the Department of Justice doing nothing. Right. Yeah. But I don't know how um, you can have a conversation and, and, and be civil mm -hmm. when you're literally attacking and intimidating mm -hmm. and bullying families of Supreme Court justices and sitting on their lawns and trying to scare their families and their kids. That is not what our country is about. We can have civil disagreements. And I think the fact that you've run this organization for as long as you have, and you haven't gone to Supreme Court justices' oh, uh, front lawns and intimidated them and all the things that we're seeing, and the fact that the media is not calling it out, and more than that, this president, mm. Joe Biden, who once f was for the Hyde Amendment, now has abandoned it, which, of course, is um, he was for um, making sure that taxpayer dollars did not go to fund abortion. He's mm. now abandoned that position. Mm -hmm. Um is just crazy. And then the Department of Justice. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask you about another untruth that we're hearing from the media on this issue. They're trying to extrapolate that if Roe v. Wade is overturned and sent back to the states, that it'll mean other historic cases will be mm -hmm. overturned, that, that interracial marriage will be made illegal. They're trying to fear monger and create division again in our country. Of course, that's not true. No. It, and in fact, uh, in anticipation of that very accusation, Alito makes very clear in the draft decision that this doesn't touch those other those other um, those other areas at all, and that um, any uh, and he makes it clear that they're not they don't rest on row. Uh, so I mean, if anybody worried about it or thought about it, or any future judge had any concern that there would be. Uh, and a potential overturn of any of those precedents, they would look at Alito's actual words that say it is not. Do not consider this uh, an impetus to overturn any of those precedents. Well, I'm so grateful for you and your leadership. Thank you mm -hmm. for that. I think educating voters on this, is there a place they can go on your website or someplace people can go to get more information and really arm themselves with facts? Yes. As we are watching so much disinformation from the media on this yeah, issue. Yeah, I think we've got better than ever before— uh, our website is kind of takes you wherever you want to go. If you want to understand the suffragist view on abortion, why we're called Susan B. Anthony, go there. If you want to get involved in this election, then there's a way that you can help. You can go door to door. You can help there. If you're really interested in legislation, what the world's going to look like after Roe versus Wade is hopefully overturned, that's there too. It's just Google Susan B. Anthony Liston. Google Susan B. Yeah, Anthony Liston, yeah, and it'll, it'll come right up. up. All right, I'm going to throw a little curveball at you. All right, good. Um, your mom of five kids, what is your <laughs> like best mom advice for your kids right now? What are you what are you saying to them coming out of mm -hmm. this really difficult time in our country? Is there something that's resonating? Yeah. Well, I would say my best mom advice has always been kind of the same. And that is pursue the truth radically with without any concern for where where it might lead you. Hmm. And I know that seems really lofty and all that, but it but it really is. It's the only important thing you'll do in life. I mean, my kids are all over the place in terms of what they think and believe, but I trust them if they're honestly pursuing what is true, the true and the beautiful, and that they're really devoted to that, that they'll land where they should. I love that. <laughs> 
pursue the truth radically, no matter where it might lead you. I like that. I think that's good. You know, it's true. <laughs> it you know, look true. what you did. At, we at have Duke, the ability. At yeah. Duke. Well, I just think you're great. I am oh. so grateful that I've gotten to know Back you. At you. Well, let me, you just got to let me okay. say this because I tell everybody <laughs> okay. that will listen. Okay. And I'm hoping that you'll say, I'll, it'll be very obvious uh, very soon when we get on on uh, on the phone with my with my with my crowd in the pro-life yeah. movement, that you and your chairmanship are such a beautiful metamorphosis of your overall leadership. There have been great chairmen, but there is nobody like you on this. And I am so Thank proud you. of you. I wouldn't say that if I didn't believe because I know you would. <laughs> because I'm kind of known like the velvet hammer, you know. <laughs> so I just want you to know what a difference it makes at the heart of this movement to have you communicating so beautifully. I, I've watched all your clips. You're just doing a great job. Thank I'm so you. proud. Well, I'm glad that we've been able to talk about this issue. And as women, I think, mm. and as mothers, yeah. we're, we're sensitive to it. So um, just thank you for all that you do. And I'm grateful to have you on this episode so that we can talk about this before the ruling. Well, the timing and is perfect. everybody arm yourself with the facts, That's pursue right. the truth, and push back on the disinformation and the spin that we're going to get from Democrats and the media because we are on the right side of this. Amen, sister. Thanks, Marjorie. Thanks for being a real America. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm Ronna McDaniel, and this is what Republicans stand for. Join us next time on Real America.